case to come before the court in the state of Ohio v. Scott Shook. Uh, each party will have 15 minutes to present their argument. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you do plan to reserve time, please let me know so I'm keeping track of the time. Arguments are being recorded, so please keep your voices up and remain behind the podium. Introduce yourself. You should not use the names of children or minors or victims during your argument should that be relevant. And you can refer to those individuals by initials or uh, generic terms. We have read your briefs. We're ready to proceed when you are. I would just ask the appellant counsel whether or not you would like to reserve time for rebuttal. Sure, I would reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal. Good morning, Giovanna Bremge, on behalf of Mr. Scott Shook. May it please the court. I have presented to you two assignments of error, sufficiency and manifest weight, which is probably the most common assignments that you see. But I would suggest to you that these are a little bit different and that the, uh, at least to one of my, um, in my soul, you know, well, in my main argument, um, it's probably a matter of first impression uh, for this court, or it, it generally, because it's an area of law uh, that I think myself and the states indicated in their brief, it's just not an area of law uh, that is commonly litigated, apparently. But Mr. Shook was charged with four counts. He was only convicted of two, and that was count two and four, um, aggravated vehicular homicide and also reckless operation of a vessel. Um, the facts, because they are relevant with these assignments, um, they, Mr. Shook and his friend were uh, celebrating, they went out on a boat, they were fishing, uh, there was some testimony about drinking throughout the day from both gentlemen. Uh, when they went to go into uh, the dock here in Lorraine, they, uh, Mr. Shook was initially driving, he went, uh, he told the, his friend to go to the back of the boat remove the rod holders, uh, because that's what you do when you go dock your boat. And one of them was stuck, apparently there was some testimony that one is sometimes difficult. And so Mr. Shook went back, got that rod holder, and as he was walking back, uh, and I'm sorry, when he was fixing that rod holder, the other gentleman um, was driving. When he was walking back, then they hit a brake wall and the other gentleman unfortunately passed away. Uh, the issue is around the trial sort of surrounded who was driving the boat at the time. Um, but ultimately, the state, well, Mr. Shook presented an expert and so did the state. The state presented a rebuttal um, expert about where the placement of uh, each gentleman was in relation to the crash, crash reconstruction. And it became fairly clear that Mr. Shook was not operating the boat, that instead, um, the other gentleman was. So uh, he was not driving the boat, I should say, because operate is, is the key issue here. So um, at some point, the state seems to concede that Mr. Shook was not driving the boat. Um, even their own expert said that maybe he was behind the seat and the, there was testimony that you couldn't drive from behind the seat because the seat would... Um, would touch the wheel and it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to drive it. So the state sort of changes their argument at that point to, well, operate means to put into movement. So if you, um, if you throttle the boat to start it at that point, you are reliable. Attorney Bramke, yes. I just like to zero in a little bit on the, the uh, issue you raised in the first assignment of error, error in your brief, you, you say this whole question is, that um, and under that assignment of error is whether the operation of a vessel under RC 154707A, which is the reckless act statute, correct, um, can be proven when an individual has no physical control of the vessel. So that is the, the issue that you raise in the first assignment of error, but weren't those two um, counts merged and wasn't he sentenced on the aggravated vehicular homicide? Yes, but the, without that um, conviction on count four, I believe that it would also have to um, vacate on count two. And it is a little bit strange because I rely heavily on the definition of operate on a charge that he was found not guilty of, 
but operate is not um, defined necessarily in the um, in the section that he and I think that's what the state was getting at is well there's no definition of operate in the reckless section that he um, you know that that he was ultimately convicted of. But it, again, I just think this really isn't an area of law because of the vessel end of things that is heavily litigated. And so that leaves us with looking at other definitions of operate, um, you know, particularly the 1547.11. Um, and that basically says a boat that's, that's in the waters, but not docked. We can also look at the definition of uh, operation motor vehicle just to give us context although I agree that this isn't a motor vehicle but that's under 4511.01 uh, HHH and also um, was further clarified in the Wilson case which I rely on and the state talks about that um, in the Wilson case I believe it was a young female she was kicked out of a home she was drinking instead of driving the vehicle she stays in the car but it was cold night so she starts the vehicle um, for heat, but doesn't move the vehicle. And in that case, Ohio Supreme Court said, well, you need movement for operation. So again, um, this just is, that's why I believe it's a matter of first impression. It's just not an area where we're going to have that definition. But I would dispute the state's argument that there, it's moot because of the merger. Um, I also think that holding otherwise would set a pre bad precedence because ultimately if what the state is arguing is if you put a boat into motion you're liable for every action going forward and particularly in boat operation more so than in vehicle operation this vehicle usually that person drives until it's stopped boats people are going in and out and driving and not driving um, also considering, you know, this is a personal use boat, but a commercial uh, vehicle and like cruise ships where they may not stop that operation for a very long period of time, whether the, that initial operator would, would be liable for every action going forward. Um, it's a bad precedent. Um, there's also this Marlington case. It was a um, sort of an odd case, a civil case, in which a school district was, uh, they were attempting to hold a school district liable and um, circumvent the immunity for negligent operation of motor, motor vehicle when one student had molested another student on the bus. And again, um, that in that case, they said, well, uh, you know, you, you they operate, um, that only the driver can be the operator of the motor vehicle. So again, my argument is Mr. Tripp wasn't the driver uh, and he wasn't, that the state failed to meet their burden that he operated the vehicle um, for purposes of the conviction. Also, I have a second assignment there, the manifest weight. But aren't the standards for operability, is it, isn't the aggravated vehicular homicide, um, aren't the elements different? Isn't it participate or, and operate or participate in the operation and state is different? It's, yes, but I believe, well, I believe without, again, without that, um, meeting that operation, you can't convict under that first, that, well, it's the second count, but the first count that he was convicted of. Um, yeah, the second assignment there is manifest weight. Again, there was an expert presented. She testified pretty clearly and Mr. Shook could not have been the driver of the vehicle. Um, my argument is that they, the state didn't need their burden of persuasion here. Again, that Mr. Shook was the driver. Um, so I would reserve the rest of my time for a rebuttal. Very well. You'll have your full five minutes, Attorney Bradley. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Mark Koza on behalf of the state of Ohio and Prosecutor J.D. Tomlinson of Burren County. Um, looking at the evidence, like the state did meet uh, on the first assignment of error, it should be dismissed as moot. The state did prevent su sufficient evidence with regards to this. Um, as Shook did in his brief, they conceded all the elements to the offense, specifically only focusing on operate. And as Mr. Shook was only convicted of count two, the reckless operation, or the ag vehicular assault A2A, and the reckless 
Michael's operation, the N3, the 154707, um, Shook highly relies on Wilson and getting into this concept of physical control or not. Um, Wilson is very clear that if there is no definition of operate, then you are to look to the plain meaning. And looking at that, 4511, which they say is only applicable to the 4511HHH is only applicable to 4511 in chapters 4513, that definition is not applicable here. The definition under uh, 1547.11 is not applicable, so we have. We don't have the definition, but if we were to look to the context, the issue is operation. And looking at the facts of this case, Shook takes KH out on the water, he admits at the scene that he was operating the boat, at the hospital he was operating the boat, he then later gives a statement that he was operating the boat. His wife even writes that statement for him because he can't write it, and then all of a sudden, when it comes closer to trial, he has experts that say he couldn't have operated the boat. However, there was um, the state's own expert that said that he could operate the boat. Uh, one of the first witnesses on the scene uh, even testified that the boat could be operated as long as you could reach the, the things. Um, looking at recklessness, we would say that his behavior was definitely recklessness towards these charges, given the fact that, and we look to the the Gogan case, which is a summit case, 9th District. Um, he, in that case, the individual was driving a car, which is different, um, had four to five beers in their system, was playing with their iPod, and that was generally recklessness. And here, the facts of the case from Shook's own statements continually from the days of the events is he was operating the boat, he had drank beer, the GPS dimmer was too bright, there was no lights on the boat. He then is operating the boat, Cage is having issues with the rod holders. He goes back to his system. So he walks away and then comes back, and then it's too late and he tries to swerve out of the way. Uh, the state's expert was consistent with that. Even if we look at their defense's own experts, they even admitted that that was reckless, that that behavior, that they wouldn't operate a boat in that way. Um, the, uh, Shook continually wants to say that this is kind of like, well, if you're operating a boat, and now if you walk away, you're liable. You turn a boat on, you start it, you're liable for everything. And that is just not factually consistent with this case. Obviously with a car, that's almost impossible because how would you turn a car on and then just get out of the front seat? I mean, you'd still be liable if you turned your car on or failed to turn it off and hit something. Um, this case here, we have his own statements. We have an expert's testimony um, that are consistent with him operating the boat. Um, the appellant discussed or, or mentioned when there's plenty of statement of facts that KH at some point was driving when the victim was driving when Mr. Shook went back to work on the fish rod holder. Is that in the record clear that that's, KH started to drive? That's not clear in the record. I think that's what developed later or they testified towards that later that he was operating. Uh, Shook states on his direct that, oh, well, I initially said... He, he was operating because I wanted to take the blame, but then when it came time for trial or giving evidence to their experts, he then said he wasn't operating. So I would say that statement, uh, the credibility of that statement, is well, I wouldn't give much weight to that, given that he changed the story. Obviously, that was more towards manifest weight, but I would argue that. Counsel, uh, but supposedly the difference here is he just didn't change the statement for no reason. He said, I I can understand that, but he did not say that to the investigator the day after. Uh, a month later, when he went to go pick up his belongings, he didn't say that at all. That all I just made that up. So even before this was even indicted, he had an opportunity to say, hey, I just came forward because of this. He didn't do any of that. It only came time when they were trying to get an expert that now it's time to change their statements. How long after the accident did the victim die? Uh, I believe it was... One second, Your Honor. I may have it in my brief. I apologize. Um, That's okay. We can we can find out if it's in the record. I just I just don't remember it from the brief, but I know it was a long time. Not a long time, but it wasn't immediate. 
It wasn't, it wasn't immediate. And even his statement he gave out, I think he was still alive then, Your Honor, uh, wasn't indicted until this happened in July 17th. It wasn't indicted until December of that year. Um, looking to manifest weight, uh, Your Honors, I don't think there's anything significant about the facts of this case that are, would lead you to believe that the jury was mislaid or something. I think it simply comes down, as I said in my brief, that you state presented evidence and an expert defense presented their evidence and an expert and the jury just favored the recklessness. And I, I cited to the fifth district case, the B, which was also an act of vehicular assault with a, a, a boat. And even there, the, uh, the court found that, um, that just they reached different conclusions and it was a matter for the jury to sort, not for them to decide one was better than the other. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, I wanted to address a few things about um, Judge Stevenson's question about the record being clear, uh, and also Judge Carr's question about the timing. I think the record is very clear. Even in addition to the statements made, um, which uh, Judge Carr alluded to the fact that the reason um, Mr. Schiff changed his statement is because um, the victim was, they were celebrating his passage of the police academy. He wanted to take the blame. Uh, Mr. Schiff doesn't have a profession where um, the criminal record would uh, change his, his career path, uh, but this gentleman did. So he later changed, it. I, I look back in my brief and I had that he had, I had passed several days later, but I agree with the timeline that at the time of the first statement that that gentleman had not passed. Um, but what's very clear from the record is the experts' uh, statements, both experts, uh, which very clearly uh, indicate that Mr. Shook was not the driver to the extent that the state changed their position later on in the trial. Um, I also want to address the issue about the merger and the fact that, well, count four um, merged with count two, so uh, why does this operation even matter? Well, the state charge is under 2903.06A2A, which requires the operation. A2B is participating in operation, but I would argue it's participating in operation and construction zone. It's different. Um, but regardless, it's a reckless offense. So it requires this conviction under four to convict under the two. Um, but it ultimately is not just reckless, it's reckless operation. So we have the question still remains, what is operation? Um, and I would submit to you that the state's definition under operation and just putting a vessel into motion uh, and then being liable for all of the acts going forward is a terrible precedence to set, um, and it's not what the law calls for. It's not if we look outside of the uh, outside of the um, case law about vessels, because there's not a lot about vessels, boats, uh, but there is about motor vehicles. That the Supreme Court has repeatedly said it requires that it's a driver and that there's movement, and that just wasn't the case with Mr. Shook because he wasn't um, the driver. Mr. Shook has, you know, repeatedly said that is an unfortunate situation, um, that he feels terribly for the family, but unfortunately, uh, legally, it just doesn't meet the definition of operation, his involvement that night. And because of that, both of the convictions under count two and four must be vacated. And so, just so I understand your argument, so you're saying that there could not be conviction on count two without conviction on count four. Correct, because of the recklessness. And the count four is the recklessness uh, offense. Any other questions? It just uh, brings to my mind, both sides are saying this is probably an issue of first impression in regard to operability with um, a vessel with a boat. But it brings to my mind that we may be facing this issue to uh, uh, absolutely in regard to automobiles as well because now with the computer driven automobiles and the self self driving features that are involved and so forth so this is uh, unfortunate case but a very fascinating area I agree with you and uh, sometimes the law is slow to catch up but you all have an opportunity to make some uh, important case law 
out here. So we appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both for your presentation. The court will take a matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course uh, on the day that it is released. The court of courts will mail you a copy of the decision, and the opinions will also be posted on the Ohio Supreme Court website. Thank you both very much.